Here, however, we present a case of a double-blind experiment in which someone not associated with the project comes into the experimental room, places an object into a can chosen at random from ten aluminum cans, then puts the remainder of the numbered tops on also at random. The randomizer then leaves the area and the experimenters enter the experimental area with Geller, with neither the experimenters nor Geller knowing which can contains the object. In this particular case, the target is a three-quarter inch steel ball which already resides in one of the ten cans in the box. The ten cans having been arranged neatly, Geller's task now is to determine which of these ten cans holds the steel ball bearing. He doesn't touch the cans or the table. The experimental protocol is for the experimenter to remove the cans one at a time in response to Geller's instructions as he points or calls out a can top number. Eventually, there will be just two or three cans left, and Geller will then indicate, both by gesture and in writing, which one of the remaining cans contains the target. It is only at the end of the experiment that Geller touches the can that he believes contains the object. The protocol included the possibility that he might touch a can accidentally. In such case, that would have counted as a miss. Here he writes the selected number. This, you might say, is a kind of ten can Russian roulette. He has made his choice. The steel ball is found. In later repetitions of this same experiment, he was finally weaned away from the dousing technique where he runs his hands over the can. He got to the point where he could walk into a room, see the cans lined up on a blackboard sill, and just pick up the one that contained the target. We have no hypothesis at this point as to whether this is a heightened sensitivity of some normal sense or whether it is some paranormal sense. Now, we are repeating the experiment with a different target object. One of these cans is filled with room temperature water. Again, the can was filled by an outside person who randomized the position of the cans. Then the box that contained the cans was rotated by a second person so that there is no one person in the room who knows the location of the target can. As you can see here, there is less hand motion by Geller over the can. The protocol, as before, involves his calling out the number or pointing and one of the experimenters removing the can at Geller's call. At this point in time, he is asked to make his choice both by writing the number down as well as making a selection by hand.
you will note that he is making a final test to be sure of his selection. Tentatively, he reaches, and having made the selection, now looks to see whether water is inside the can. He now waters the plant by the contents of the can. You will note he is very pleased with finding this target because he had doubts at the outset whether he would be able to locate a can filled with water. We repeated this type of experiment 14 times. Five times involved the target being a small permanent magnet. Five times also involved a steel ball bearing as the target. Twice the target was water. Two additional trials were made one with a paper-wrapped ball bearing and one with a sugar cube. The latter two targets were not located. Geller felt that he didn't have adequate confidence as to where they were, and he declined to guess and passed. On the other 12 targets, the ball bearing, the magnet, and the water, he did make a guess as to the target location and was correct in every instance. In subsequent work with another subject, we found the subject experiencing a highly significant difference in his ability to find various targets as compared with finding the steel ball bearing. The whole array of this run had an a priori probability of one part in 10 to the 12th or statistics of a trillion to one. Here's another double-blind experiment in which a die is placed in a metal box, both box and die being provided by SRI. The box is shaken up with neither the experimenter nor Geller knowing where the die is or which face is up. This is a live experiment that you see. In this case, Geller guessed that a four was showing, but first he passed because he was not confident. You will note that he was correct, and he was quite pleased to have guessed correctly, but this particular test does not enter into our statistics. The previous runs of 10-can roulette gave a result whose probability due to chance alone is one part in 10 to the 12th we decided at the outset to carry out the die and box experiment until we got to a million to one odds, at which time the experiment was terminated. Out of ten tries in which he passed twice and guessed eight times, the eight guesses were correct, and that gave us a probability of about one in a million. We would point out again there were no errors in the times he made a guess.